Hello, I'm Matt Kelly. And I'm Matt Dancona. And this is The Two Mats for the week ending Friday the 19th of April. The podcast that says, 10 years, we'll save the West in five. <laughs> That's actually quite good, that for a change. <laughs> <laughs> What did we talk about? We, we talked about um, the smoking ban, and but we got very quickly into uh, sort of the broader philosophical nature of it. We were quite yeah. Socratic and, and, and highfalutin this week, weren't we? We were, we were. And, and then we moved on to talk about a wonderful new book by Salman Rushdie. Yeah, it, so, did. it, was, it, was, a, it was a terrifically uh, philosophical conversation. I thought it, it was, was so, you know, I mean, yeah. I think we, we, we count ourselves as, as uh, mature philosophers, so <laughs> we do, it's indeed. completely natural. There'll be a school... Of, yes, of exactly. The two, yeah. the two mats. The two mats. <laughs> One day, maybe not. Okay. All right. Anyway, this is the two mats, episode forty-one. Enjoy. So, Matt, big topic this week is. Smoking. Smoking ban. Smoking ban. And we haven't actually talked about it much, so I don't know where no, well, either of us... I know where I, I stand on it, but I don't well, know Well, we, we went back... I, I went back and listened to our, what we said after Rishi's um, terrible conference speech. Yeah. And I think what we said was that it was a sort of... Um, you know, it, it, we were both against smoking. It was a slightly idiosyncratic thing yeah. to drop into a speech about yes. HS2 and, yes. and, and it change. It random at the a time, bit, a bit, didn't it? Well, it was yeah. random, yeah. 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 Uh, but it has, it has indeed uh, proceeded to legislation. So this week, the Commons voted on it, uh, and quite a, it was quite a big and intense occasion. And so uh, maybe we could um, ask producer Matt to give us a, a blast of um, one of the nation's favourite authors. <laughs> yes. The Prime Minister who finished second to a lettuce, Liz <laughs> Truss, giving her views on smoking bans. And my real fear is that this is not the final stage that the health police want to push. They are the health police. They are the health police. They want to be able to make their own decisions about what they eat, what they drink, and how they enjoy themselves. So, I mean, that's that's Liz Truss um, in her uber libertarian mood, basically saying that this, this new ban, which it's a slightly weird me measure isn't it i mean it means that people born in or after 2009 won't be able to legally buy cigarettes yeah um and for people like trust it's the slippery slope to stalinism and the gag, yeah. which yeah. is a slight overreaction but there we go and um it was interesting because it you know i mean there are lots of ways of looking at it and i suppose the first thing to get out of the way is is the kind of tory politics of it all so the, there was a free vote which is interesting in itself. 57 Conservatives voted against it, including Kemi Badnock, the Business and Trade Secretary, five other ministers. Um, there were 106 abstentions, including Penny Mordaunt and Priti Patel. And I suppose, you know, as we said just now, you know, it's this rather idiosyncratic fixation that yeah. Sunak has. He gets, he gets fixated, doesn't he, as yeah. with small boats. Well, I, I mean, it's been there's been a lot of conversation around is this going to be his legacy? Mm -hmm. And well, I, I kind of, I've got some sympathy for that. I, I'm really conflicted on this because I think he's a complete, you know, total, yeah. total loser. But even a, a stuck clock at the right time. Yeah, so, yeah. so what I thought would be what's interesting for me is is the philosophical so yes, there's two there's I, two I strands agree. aren't there? there's the political as you've just touched on but then there's the philosophical conversation around is it right to tell people what they can and can't do and what where is the where is the greater good and i'm i'm fascinated to know I think where you stand I on that i totally agree with you um okay so just to finish off the tory stuff because yeah, yeah. it kind of gets it um th this was basically another drill for the forthcoming Tory leadership contest. I mean, you, you've got, as I said, Kemi Badenoch voting against it, um, Swella Braverman and Robert Jenrick, possible candidates voting against it, and abstentions, Penny Morden, Priti Patel. Um, they're both, what they're doing is gesturing support pain-free, because they yeah. knew that Labour would get the, the vote through, and they did, uh, to the Conservative Libertarian base. And, you know, the kind of Tory members who still harum for a bit about safety belts and 
fire hydrants. Do, do, and, are there still Tory people who yeah, harump about safety belts? I mean, they 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 harump about everything, every yeah, encroachment yeah. upon yeah. their their lives, their land. You know, yeah. um, and 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 sort of have that 20th, 20th century formation of the Tory mindset, which is that. Um, you know, to be a conservative is to oppose the encroachments of the state. Yeah. And that's still how most members, we're not talking about yeah. Tory voters here, but, um, you know, how members see the, the, the state as a bad thing, you yeah. know, except when it's giving them their pensions and when yeah. they need the NHS and all the and rest of it. And their tax breaks, yeah. And their tax breaks, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but... I, I mean, in this respect, it's just all part of the long death rattle of this government. You know, the yeah. Tory party is disaggregating. Um, but then to your point, I think it's a it's actually a sort of micro case of a huge debate that we're going to be having a lot. Yes. Which is about the about government and freedom and the tensions between them. And and this is the key, I think, the challenges of this century Yes, right. Well, so, okay, so let's pause there for a That's second. That's the sort of framing of it. Do you agree with the ban? Yes, in the sense that I agree with the ban, uh, but only as part of a much bigger suite of measures uh, to stop smoking. Right. You know, I mean, I, I think it's a very odd way of doing it, which is, I mean, bad knocks, sort of the, the pretext she offered for voting against was you're going to have two categories of adult. Yeah. You know, those born after 2009 won't be able to go into a tobacconist and buy, you know, 20 JPS. Um, yeah. Those who were born before will. Like a day before. Which is yeah. obviously ridiculous. Now, but, but well, on that point, I kind of think that the reality of, of what they're saying, which is that um, smoking is unique because it's, it's, it's really, it's harmful w without redemption, without mitigation. Yes. There's no upside to it. So in that regard, it's not quite like drinking. But we can talk about drinking. Yes. Like, we can talk about eating, you know, crap and food and, and stuff like this. And... But it, so there's no upside to smoking. Uh, but it is addictive. So the way the law's been framed or the solution to getting people stopping has been framed like that in recognition that there's, it's it's much harder to do something about it if you are a smoker. That's true. So they're saying you're a smoker now. That's, that we recognise that. That is the best argument for yeah. it. Um, yeah. But doesn't that define unique problem about smoking yes it does yeah the, the least impressive argument is the one that trust and others will have been making which is it's a slippery slope yeah. right well look every policy is a slippery slope in the yeah. sense that you could go further yeah i mean that's what government is you you yeah you, well shipping people off to rwanda is a bit of a slippery slope as well well it, it, it's a slope on which no one is moving we're just yeah, spending exactly. a lot of money I mean, yeah i bet the way to slippery, i mean yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a it's a silly argument and the other thing that i think is worth pointing out is that Smoking, contrary to a lot of prediction, smoking measures against smoking are working. Twenty percent of the population used to smoke in 20, as recently as twenty eleven, right? Yeah. And now it's down to thirteen. Yeah. Now that's that shows you that the various, you know, the sort of essentially ostracising of smokers and and, yeah. and 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 other they are they are having an effect. Does that include COVID. vapes? That kind of uh, no, and of right. course that's a separate yeah. thing. And it's yeah. worth mentioning the fact that there are this is not the only measure in that legislation but it's still causing about 80,000 deaths a year in the UK it is in terms of preventable illness um, by far the yeah. biggest cost for the yeah. NHS about 17 billion a year is the estimate and it, it smoking rates amongst older teens are still high apparently about 12 12 percent which yeah. is 16 to 17 year olds that's yeah, high. that's high that it's high yeah and and the point you made matt i think is 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 where we really um hit the bone which is it is unbelievably addictive yeah nicotine i mean it, have you ever smoked no right but, but as you know i you know i stopped yeah. drinking 20 yeah, years yeah, ago yeah. now now you know i've spoken to a lot of people who've stopped drinking and found it rel you know relatively easy yeah um but i know a lot of them have struggled over very long periods of sobriety yeah. to stop smoking. And, I've, and I, I mean, I've smoked. I started smoking when I was 14 by the news agents in Hightown in, uh, in, in where I grew up in, in Merseyside who used to sell what was called a Lucy for 10 pence, which was a loose cigarette and a match. Right. One match. Just one. And if it was rainy and, and blowy. And a match. Yeah. 
if it was rainy and blowy and you didn't like the fag with That's the match, it. he was very grumpy about giving you a second yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I went to work, obviously, and I, I used to sit opposite, uh, right next to a guy called Sid Dye, who, brilliant, brilliant journalist, who I'm pretty sure is dead now. But, and Sid had like really, you know, not emphysema, but he had like dodgy lungs. Mm. And and we used to, the whole office would sit there oh, smoking God, yeah. around Sid and he'd moan about it. And, and, you know, and it was just like, oh, shut up, Sid, you know. And the walls of the office would be like a shade of nicotine yellow. And then I remember when the band came in, having to smoke in a little cupboard about the size of this Well, the first studio, thing was smoking you know. rooms, wasn't That's it? That's right, smoking yes. rooms, yeah. which reeked of, of smoke, obviously, and it intensified the... You used to walk around stinking, stinking of stale smoke, yeah, smoke you know. Yeah. And then I gave up. I've given up twice, which if that's not an oxymoron, but I've given up yeah. twice in my life. And it's so easy to to slip back in that nicotine and the whole thing. And it was the truth is it was it was James Dean that made me of course a smoker because I mean look to, you, know, you know I'm and I say this as a non smoker um, in in culture yeah. You know, uh, smoking can look incredibly cool. Yeah, That's the totally, problem with it. Totally. And and um, people who smoke tell me that you know they don't get really get going until they've had that first nicotine yeah. hit of the day. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, you know, what's interesting? I mean, to talk about the difference with drinking because people immediately move to drinking and say, "Oh, you want to prohibit you know prohibition?" I don't uh, at all because I don't know many moderate smokers. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know, I know. The vast majority of people I know who drink are, you know, moderate drinkers yeah. and fit of one sort or another and can and can cut back or, you know, they let themselves go a bit yeah. over Christmas or whatever. But but I don't know any I've never met a moderate smoker. No. When we talk about the, the conversation about the prohibition of dangerous things. Yes. There's loads of dangerous things. We all Skiing. Do. Ski well, I'll give you an example. I used to go I used to be really into motorbikes. Right. And got more and more obsessed with motorbikes and started doing more and more track days and stuff yeah. like this and riding huge, hugely powerful machines and had a couple of friends who died and all, you know, so I was, mm. went to the Isle of Man TT a couple of times, you know, watched that, incredible. When my, younger, when my youngest child now was born, I looked myself in the mirror and I thought, I cannot responsibly no, carry I, yeah, on doing this. Get it. And I stopped riding my motorbike that day. Now, the difference between riding a motorbike, which is inherently dangerous to me, and not harmful to anybody else, yes. and smoking, is that you can make the decision to stop riding it. The yes. motorbike doesn't turn up the next morning saying, ride me, ride me, ride me. You no, know, you no, one no one offers you a, a, a motorbike in the pub. Do no, they? that's right. <laughs> they that's don't right. come up to you and say, do you want to go outside and ride a motorbike? There's no yeah. motorbike patch. You don't need one. You know, it's... <laughs> uh, you fancy a Harley. That's you know, right. No one says that. That's right. But smoking's different. Smoking is different. Smoking's so different. I do get the logic behind the, the yes. way they're going I mean, about I, it. it. It's... Um, and and specifically in the health service, and we've talked about this before. You know the 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 costs that are heading towards the NHS. Yeah. Uh, let alone now, you know, where it is scandalously underfunded. But in the future, as people live longer and so on, us and medicine gets more elaborate and 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 more diseases can be treated, but but over a long period of time, the costs heading towards the NHS are stupendously high. Yeah. Um. And every government I can remember has said we must do more preventive medicine. We must do more preventive measures. Well, it's time. It really is time now to to take that seriously. And part of that is, I think, but effectively banning smoking. Yeah. Um, and and. But would you ban it for everybody? Um, I think what you just what you said earlier about the the difficulty of banning it for people who are already smoking yeah. is, a, is a very good point. Do you know the other thing that I think, so smoke, let's take it, let's look from the point of view of a smoker now as well. Yes. Okay. Do, do you know how much cigarettes are mm. these days? 15, 15 16 quid, quid, quid a, a packet. packet. Yeah. I mean, so it's costing the average smoker 2,000 quid to to smoke. Wow. And, the, the you know, obviously the rationale behind the inordinate tax is that you've got to mitigate somehow the cost to the yeah. NHS. And to, and also there's loads of other costs lost to productivity. And it's somewhere between 10 and 20 billion, right, people would say, the cost to the yeah, UK. Yeah. But if you accept that it's an addiction and it's hard to get off, you could prescribe cigarettes to current smokers. <laughs> And and say okay, but no, you know no they're more, the only. Yes. You have to get them through the NHS. 
Make them so they become like methadone. They become like methadone. Yes, you know, and then you wean people off. And yes. I know that all this sounds very paternalistic, but I do think that if you ask most well, smokers, would they like to give up? They'd say yes. I think we have to wean ourselves off the word paternalistic, right. and we have to wean ourselves off the words nanny state. Yeah, you know, because it's sort of reflexive now. You know, there are all these things. I mean, we, we've talked a couple of times on the podcast about ultra processed foods and you know refined sugars and things like that. And there's no doubt that. We, we need radical measures in that area now is it taxation is it regulation i don't know yeah i'm not educated enough on that particular field but i do know we're going to have to take those measures and if every time one of those measures is is taken there's a sort of you know cordon around it of Mm. oh you can't do that because it's nanny state paternalistic the problems of the 21st century are they all involve government doing more big stuff that yeah. won't suit libertarians you know yeah. it, it, it is sort of things like climate change um people living longer and health issues management of population mobility regulation of a tech revolution that's moving yeah. at light speed yeah um inequality that threatens the is threat now threatening the social fabric you know it's so bad uh, global insecurity. I mean, the list goes on. All those things are going to, you know, talking about rolling back the frontiers of the state, yeah. as yeah. Thatcher did, in this context, the 2020s, it just sounds silly. Yes, I agree. Uh, and yet, that, you know, that is what a lot of right-wingers are still doing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what's going on here, I think, to sort of try and mesh the, the philosophical and the political, I think there, there is a legitimate folklore memory of the 20th century which was is you know, amongst older people of of um by which i mean people in their 40s and above or let's say which is a memory of totalitarianism and its consequences you know and a kind of retreat from anything that has that whiff mm-hmm. but i actually think the thing that's really weaponizing this now is covid because on the right now the pandemic around the world, not not just here, it, the pandemic is sort of seen as that it, as a drill for an overmighty state surveilling us, recording everything digitally, you know, slowly introducing authoritarian measures that lockdown and the vaccine rules and the masks were all just prep. Yeah. And that argument, which during the pandemic was only made by crazy people, mm. is now being made by... A lot of people and it's distorting the argument i was very interested that chris witty the chief medical officer was sent out to defend this legislation on the today program and i think he wrote a piece in the guardian anyway to do the media yeah and his points were very well made but i also thought i wonder how triggering this is for a lot of people who think christ you know we're it's mr covid dr covid's back to tell us what yeah. to do yeah. and um you know, he was doing his job. He's the CMO for England. You know, he's, she should be doing that. That's fine. But I do think that COVID plays a really big part. I think it plays a big part in politics generally, actually. But it's moment. lodged in people's heads. It's lodged in people's idea. heads. And you can see it in the media, you know, the way that the Telegraph presented the lockdown files. You know, right. the, 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 you know, their position now is that lockdown wasn't necessary um rishi was a hero because he was he, fighting he was that. fighting yeah, it yeah. you know it it it, ba- it bankrupted the, the the economy um uh well, it didn't quite but you know uh furlough was a waste of money um the keeping of kids away from school was 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 lunatic because kids didn't really suffer it very badly etc cetera, etc cetera. so everything now there's a very very hardened school of, of opinion on the right on both sides of the atlantic that you know covid was linked to and it gets very conspiratorial and anti-semitic mentions of george soros and bill gates you yeah. know you know you know the, the the kind of memes in this um but it but it is very strong and it's yeah. a it's a that it virally not to pun but you know it, it has become very embedded in writer center thinking and not just sort of maga thinking but but right-wing people generally i wonder whether with with the particular issue of smoking though that they've picked the wrong 
fight because yes there's been there's been a lot of surveys in in uh, red wall seats expecting to hear that kind of can't they just leave us alone you know with the smoke you know the old john reed kind of yeah you know what in the bag and yeah exactly why would you deprive us of the few yeah. pleasures we've got and actually the truth is is that when asked most people will say absolutely it's a filthy habit costs loads of money yeah. crippling the nhs ban it now you know so social norms do change yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe they've picked the wrong battle with smoking. I, th- I think that's right. Um, and I, I also think that, I mean, to look at it in a slight frame, it's slightly more optimistically than I just did. I think there's a big split in the global populist nativist right on this, actually. Because um, I think people like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, they actually, they want government to do stuff, big stuff. Uh, that's not, not the kind of stuff we might want, you mm. know, like more the NHS or, but, you know, the kind of stuff that suits them, um, building walls, targeting yeah. welfare at their base, welfare at their base voters, um, what Johnson called levelling up and hasn't happened. But, you know, he wanted yeah. to do it. And then there's a wing of the populist movement that cares almost pathologically about liberty. Yeah. So this week, um, Javier Emilia, the, the, the president of Argentina, was, was interviewed by little Ben Shapiro, yeah. one of our, who we saw at the yeah. end too. And he is very small. Very small. Um, very impre- but very impressive in, but his, own in his own little way. way. In yeah. a tiny, little, teeny, <laughs> yeah. tiny little way. Yeah. Um, and what was interesting was Millet was not in crazy loco mode. He was in I'm an economist mode. And he was very articulate and interesting. But he is so libertarian. I mean, you know, it was Friedrich Hayek. It was Milton Friedman. You know, he's, he's already abolished um, 10 ministries and he wants to introduce another 2,000 measures into the Argentinian Congress, you know, right. further reducing the size of government. Now, yeah, that's a, you can say that's an outlier case, but a lot of, a lot of right-wing people in, in, in this world do think that, mm. that you know, the task of, 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 of a, any conservative government is to is to make government smaller. Yeah, and also, it could, you know, we had an IMF, we're recording this on... Thursday and the splash in the FT this morning was about the IMF warning Sunak to rein in the gap between spending and revenues. Absolutely. And we are a much poorer country than we like to Absolutely. think. You know, obviously Brexit has contributed to this, COVID, a number of other things. But that structural idea that we are that Britain is like I know we keep saying, Oh, we're the sixth biggest economy in the world yeah. and all of this business, but we we're, we're not a country that can have roads like they do in France. We're not no. a country that can have a health system like they do in Sweden. You know, we are very much confined by shrinking, diminishing resources, money resources. Yeah. And, and uh, well, I mean, I think we, we both agree that, you know, uh, until we get back at minimum into some relationship with the single market, yeah, that is going to remain yeah. true. Just one thought before we go for a break about you know this whole again just looking at the bigger picture and the 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 philosophy of bans yes can you think of a single ban that a government's brought in in you know highly contentious issue and they've got it over the line that anybody's ever gone back and repealed it's a very interesting question i mean obviously in america the 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 road yeah road right yeah, yeah, um yeah. but but i mean the, some bands have um faltered haven't they the dangerous dogs issue is, uh-huh. is is a good example of that something that was rushed yes um but generally speaking and of course this is what libertarians always argue yeah is that no one ever hands liberty back yeah. and i think one of the tasks of the new government assuming there is a new government is going to have to be and again you know this is to a, a challenge for keir starmer and his colleagues which is how do you frame the reality that there is going to need to be more smarter government without appearing authoritarian yourself? Because, you know, the, the Tories, whatever form they take after the, the election, assuming they're in opposition, will be longing to pounce on nanny state, you know, um, paternalist, going back to, you know, the worst of Labour. And I think that Starmer's got to think of some robust rhetoric and thinking that says, no, you know, this is not ideology. This is a response to the needs of the 21st century. Yeah. This is actually pragmatic. You know, this is not an attack on people's individual liberty for the sake of it. Yeah. Um, Sh- shall we also just say the unsayable, which is on. that it's entirely possible. There's a grave danger that in 20 years' time, Rishi Sunak might be remembered for doing something 
positive. Yes. Well, I mean, I assume. Um, I mean, I always assume that one of the reasons he's against smoking is because people of his wealth and background don't like smoking. You know, yeah. they they like microdosing at Stanford yeah. Business School. <laughs> yeah. You know, and arguing about. I'd be well up for that. Well, would you? Uh, I don't know. I think no, I, I, I'm, I'm not really. You know, I, as you know, I lead a sheltered life. Um, <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I think for him, there's something gross and non-you and common and you know about yeah, smoking. Yeah, yeah. However, who cares? Because you're right. I mean, it might well be that by accident, in the yeah, even as bits of red hot engine casing were <laughs> flying across the Tory yeah. chain, you know. Um, He's, he might accidentally have got something right. Yeah, yeah. you know. Well, I, let's hope so. Let's hope so. I hope so. You know, I, I think it's a good thing, and I think that you know, I particularly like the. I do like the idea, particularly of kids not be, being able to smoke. I mean, I'm also powerfully aware that kids are amazingly resourceful. Yes, right. That's right, and we'll find a way. And yeah. you know, if ever there's a demographic that will find a way of um, yeah. getting hold of. Yeah. tabs and you know whatever definitely it'll be them but Fantastic. you can but try you can but try and uh, so uh, great conversation we're going to come back in the second half and have a chat about a genuinely a proper author a proper author not list trust not list proper trust. proper proper author so join us in the second half any minute now The BAFTA TV Awards with P&O Cruisers are on their way. And in this series of Countdown to the BAFTAs, I'm going to be assembling a top panel of TV experts and stars to discover exactly what it takes to become a BAFTA-nominated TV production. As well as that, we're going to be taking you behind the scenes of the BAFTA TV Craft Awards to meet the talented crew, writers and directors who make some of your favourite TV shows. That's Countdown to the BAFTAs with me, Alex Zane. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tune in on May the 12th on BBC One and iPlayer to discover the winners. So, Matt, you have the, the book in front of you. I do. What are we going to talk about? Well... Although it is depressing that um, when I checked this morning, we're recording this on Thursday, Liz Truss was at number six in the Amazon chart. You no, know, really? Yeah, I'm afraid so. There is no doubt what the book of the week and, and I'm sure one of my books of the year will be, uh, which I, you know, more or less in one sitting, which is uh, Salman Rushdie's Knife, mm. which, as people may know, it's a funny thing because it's a book he absolutely didn't want to write, but it's fantastic that he was able to, to write it. Yeah. Because, uh, as we know, he was brutally attacked uh, on stage at a, an event in 2022, August 2022, in Chautauqua in upstate New York. And in 27 seconds, yeah. he was stabbed approximately 15 times. And this is a 75-year-old yeah. sort of literary legend confronting a 24-year-old attacker. 27 seconds sounds like it's it's quick, but it's, I I, I, thought, I did think we should do 27 seconds of silence, but then people would switch off. But I do recommend people look at a clock, go for yes. 20 and imagine yourself being stabbed through Anderson the duration Cooper of did that. exactly that in his interview yeah. with Rushdie, and it is it was amazing. It felt like a an, a, an eternity. Who, who does that? In the- Anderson Cooper in his 60 oh, really? minutes interview. He does pause he, he for 27 exactly seconds. That. Great. And it yeah. is a very long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, how did this all come about? Well, you know, most people will know, but for those that don't, in 1989, Rushdie published a book called The Stanic Verses, which is actually one of his weird magic realist novels. It's 600 pages long. I like Rushdie's writing very much, but the Ayatollah Khomeini or his advisors didn't. And he passed a death sentence, a fatwa, on Rushdie, which led to him living in hiding for almost a decade. And there were at least six state-sponsored uh, assassination plots intercepted. The Japanese translator of the Stanic verses was assassinated in 92. The Norwegian publisher narrowly escaped the same fate the year after. And then in 98, the Iranian government, after much diplomacy with the UK, declared itself, they didn't get rid of the fatwa, but they declared themselves agnostic on the fatwa. And and Rushdie sort of slowly emerged back into the light, if you like. Yeah. Um, he moves to New York and suddenly finds that he's able to lead a relatively normal life and lived in public. You yeah. know, um, but unfortunately, the murderous impulse was had not been defeated. It was just slumbering. And this was this gruesome attack in, in 2022. And 
you know, he very, as he says in the book, it was touch and go. He, he very nearly died. I've got, I've got something in common with the, the attempted assassin in that I too only read a couple of pages of Satanic Verses, but I managed to contain my homicidal urges having read those pages. And it just feels like I can't understand whether this guy is, is, is driven by, by that fatwa or is just mentally ill, you know. Well, um, one of the most interesting sections of the book is that he, he describes his language as his knife, metaphorically. And yeah. he, he, he imagines a dialogue with his attacker, whom he refuses to call by name. Yeah. Um, his, his trial has been postponed while there's all this fuss over the book um, at the request of his attorneys. But he, in the book, um, Rushdie imagines a dialogue with this guy this was a guy who who was very lonely lived in his um basement for four years playing video games went to the lebanon and found himself masculinized and radicalized he'd been surrounded by women in his house his mother and his sisters and went to see his father in lebanon and clearly discovered as is often the way in radicalizing and groom the grooming that goes the sort of the maleness, the, patri- the patriarchal dimension of fundamentalist violence. Right. I mean, this is all a matter of record. So I think Rushdie was onto something in that, and in that speculation. And also what is almost invariably the case is in, in, in the sort of the terrorist profile, the psychological profile, is some sort of difficulty with sex and women. Right. This you is know, what incel kind of thing. It, they're, they're basically uh, jihadi incels. Yeah. You know, and so that's, that's hit the way he looks at it. But... I mean, another thing to mention is it's very unexpectedly, it's a love story because he married a a poet and novelist called Rachel Eliza Griffiths in 2021, but very quietly because his private life had been the subject of much publicity and speculation. And he decided that they would have a quite quiet life together. But I love the story about when they met. He yes, met at he, the party, but he walked into a window. He walked into, into a, a window. A, into a window and, 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 and it was one of those sort of... Um, you know, uh, it was like a rom-com moment, you yeah. know, that, that, um, and they, they've never been apart. But, you know, he realised, I think, initially, I think, that, that he, he, was, he was worried he wouldn't be able to write at all. But when he started thinking, oh, what do I want to write about? He realised that he was, there was, there was no way he was going to be able to get to the other side and write novels again until he'd addressed the elephant in the room, which he calls a fucking enormous mastodon in my workroom waving its trunk and snorting and stinking quite a bit, which I think is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. um, but he also says, to write would be my way of owning what had happened, taking charge of it, making it mine, refusing to be a mere victim. I would answer violence with art. Mm. And then, of course, he mo- moves on, I-, I think slightly wearily, but with yeah. acceptance that this is his part of his role, historically, to the whole question of being a free speech champion. Yeah. He, you know, he says that he sort of had to accept that fortune has turned me into a sort of virtuous, liberty-loving Barbie doll, which is a wonderful... Yeah. And also records his concern, I think he's right, and I'm quoting him again, progressives had started backing away from freedom towards new definitions of the social good, according to which people would no longer be entitled to dispute the new norms. Protecting the rights and sensibilities of groups perceived as vulnerable would take precedence over freedom of speech. And we've discussed this yeah. before on the podcast, but I think he's absolutely right. Yeah. And I think that the, the proof of the pudding really is, is um, I mean, there are all sorts of incidents that have demonstrated this, but the, the, the kind of QED is, does anyone seriously think uh, that a mainstream publisher would publish the, the Stanic Verses today? No, not a cat not in hell's chance. Not a chance. Not a cat in hell's chance. Um, which, if you think about it, is kind of very sad. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it's particular to Islam as well, isn't it? This is, there's it's the it's the religion that people are yes. are scared of broaching. Yes, I, that's right. And the, the the very good writer Kenan Mallet he has said that we've internalised the fatwa, mm. and this this has led to this has sort of infected the the culture because you know 2015 there was the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris, and um, I think 12 people were. Yeah. Brutally assassinated, more more injured. And in that year, Penn America, you know, which is the, the, the great writers organization in America, decided to award the magazine Charlie Hebdo, it's a satirical magazine, the Freedom of Expression Courage Award. And and I remember this, you know, and Rushdie mentions it in the book. Um, 
242 writers in America and elsewhere wrote to PEN America complaining, saying about that... About the award? About the award, saying, obviously, killing people in magazines very bad. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, the images, the cartoons that they'd published about Islam had been offensive. You're and joking. And, and therefore, it shouldn't, you know, it was wrong of Penn to, to reward it. The, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, 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 sorry, so, so these are 240 writers. Yes. American. These are Penn members, and some of them quite wow. you know, distinguished, like Teddy Cole, saying that shouldn't have happened. Wow. And I think that was a, a kind of, you know, inflection point, really, yeah. a, 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 because it, it, it showed you where the cultural center of gravity had shifted to, mm. which is, I, I mean, I think the Rusty Affair has had a huge impact upon yeah. publishing, upon fiction. I think it has it dovetailed with social justice movements. And it, as a consequence, and there are glorious exceptions to this, but I think today's literary fiction tends to be rather cramped and constrained and well-behaved right. and, you know, you, inoffensive basically. inoffensive yeah. and you, you know it is i find absolutely ridiculous it's almost a progenitor to the whole culture war yes that we're now and, you know but I've, i find it absolutely the ridiculous right, the right to offend that you know and i've written three very undistinguished novels but you know i and what I, I i don't really want to write anymore at the they moment. weren't offensive enough that's the problem <laughs> pissing enough off probably probably true but <laughs> if i did now they would be read by sensitivity readers yeah you know and um, I was told. I was told this that perspective yes. novels now go before people who will say, "You can't say." You know all the things we see on yes. social media. You can't say this because you're appropriating no, uh, that and character's. I, I know this from you know. direct experience in other yeah. contexts. This is yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. And the other thing that I think is uh, and is often the, the case in fiction publishing now is that authors are told to quote stay in their lane, so right. they can only write about their own. Genre, uh, yeah. well, not just genre, but their but the, own background, right, their own white, male, identity, Liverpool, right? You know, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which, of course, is yeah. you only have to think about it for two seconds. Is basically abolishing fiction, yes, because the whole point of fiction, yeah. is to imagine yourself. Yeah, I mean, one of its great functions is to imagine yourself in someone else's shoes. Well, it's the death of science fiction for a start, isn't it? It's the death of science fiction, or maybe the science fiction is oh, the safe place because maybe exist, science fiction you know, is the yeah. safe place, but who yeah. knows? But I think there's a there's a real danger in this um, that the civic task of the novelist is being it used to be to be a kind of intellectual and imaginative provocateur, yeah, and, it, it and now it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's to be a kind of emotional support provider. Yeah, and he says, Rushdie. So this is going back to what he writes. He says, "Art challenges orthodoxy. Art knows that received ideas are the enemies of art." Clichés are received ideas and so are ideologies, both those which depend on the sanction of invisible sky gods and those which do not. Without art, our ability to think, to see freshly and to renew our world would wither and die. And then he says, to sort of bring it back to his case, art is not a luxury. It stands at the essence of our humanity and it asks for no special protection except the right to exist. It accepts argument, criticism, even rejection. It does not accept violence. Uh -huh, yeah. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. That's I mean, good. you know, I hope that loads of people around the world will read this book yeah. and think again about the idea that it's the most important thing is that we don't give offence. I think the most amazing thing about this book is that he managed to write it at all. I think it's so extraordinary. soon after. I mean, we've all been in situations. I remember having a gun pointed at me in South Africa and having PTSD about it in yeah. a mild form for quite some time. He was nearly stabbed to death, lost an eye in this attack, in 15 stab wounds to his yes, body. Yes, and it goes into... slashed. The book goes into, you know, absolutely necessarily, and good for him, gruelling detail yeah. about the surgeries that followed, oh the long God. weeks of rehabilitation. You know, I just, just hope that he's as well as he seems to be with that. I, I, you saw the uh, Anderson Cooper interview. Yes. I saw the Alan Yentob oh, yes, yes. interview. On, it's on iPlay. It's it is, yeah. Minutes, it's well worth seeing. It's well worth seeing. And also his wife seems absolutely brilliant. You I, know? Think that, I think that that's why yeah. I said it's a love story. You know, the, yeah. the, the, the part of the magic that got him back Yeah. But it's only, love. what is it, two years ago? August 2022. So it's less than two years. I mean, he must be, I mean, he must have the most incredible mental strength to be well, able to compose himself Well, it's very interesting. Like There's a, one of the, I mean, it's, it is very moving as yeah, a book. Yeah. Um, there's a very moving section on Martin Amos, who of course died last year, oh. and about him going to see Amos as Amos was clearly, 
you know, suffering very badly from what became terminal cancer. And they exchange emails, which in the end are sort of valedictory, you know, yeah. that, and, and he reproduced some of them. And, and one of the things that is, you know, really it's a proper lump in the throat stuff is that Amos praises him because he says that when he saw Rushdie coming into the room for dinner, he realised that the, the phrase is that Rushdie had been equal to it. Right. That the, the challenge had been made by an, a global theocratic fascistic ideology represented by a sad, lonely 24-year-old. Yeah. And he had been, he, Rushdie, had been taken to the very brink of death. Yes. And he had stood his ground, metaphorically. Yes. And the thing that courses through the book, as it does through his fiction, is this kind of hunger for life. Uh -huh. You know, because, look, magic realism is not for to everyone's taste, right? He, he would be the last person on earth. I mean, he likes people reading and buying his books, but it's not for everyone. But what, what he is all about is that his books are a kind of torrent of life and vigour and cultures colliding and converging and talking to each other. And, you know, it, it's... I think Midnight's Children, which mm. I suspect will be the book he's remembered for, which he won the Booker for and then the Booker of Bookers, is sort of a manual to 21st century living because it's all about the mishmash of modernity it's all about how things you know there is no such thing as purism that everything yeah. is ironic and 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 can you know congealing and mixing and yeah, you know chaotic, that, and chaotic exactly yeah, yeah. yeah and the glory of of the modern world is precisely in that yeah and you know the the, the battle is therefore between those who embrace that and those who hate it because they want a monoculturalism, mm. monotheism, religious fanaticism. You know, we're seeing it in America. I mean, the, the, the sort of absurdity of a man of Donald Trump's morals yeah. being, you know, beholden to people who literally believe that... Um, I mean, a lot of them, interestingly, have been arguing in the last couple of months that the war in Gaza is the start of the Second Coming. Oh, my God. The level, you know, we're reaching the end of days. Oh, so, okay. you know, it, it, your, you know, fundamentalist Islam is... I mean, we might be reaching the end of days, but <laughs> I'm not expecting a visitation but, I mean, from above. I mean, you know, fundamentalist Islam is, is, is undoubtedly the one that is sort of at the moment, um, you know, has been for quite a while now the cause of, you know, immediate terror attacks. But if you want to look at the, the sort of influence, fundamentalist Christianity in the States and indeed in Russia... Yeah, you know, Putin has embraced a very, very nasty version of Orthodox Christianity there, which is the weirdest thing, isn't it? Absolutely, but yeah. I mean, you know, the hatred of LGBT people, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know, the, the the hatred of hatred of women, mm. hatred of you know reproductive freedom, and so on and so on. Yeah. It, it, there, there is a sort of Gileadization, and all tied in with a peculiar nationalism, as well. and it always ties in. It, yeah. You know, it, it's that nationalism plus fanatical religion yeah. equals. You know the 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 threat. My God, and it is a threat. And but I, of that book, yeah. just to conclude, I mean, yeah. one thing just to say about it is that I was very moved by, it, but also incredibly cheered because if, if Salman Rushdie, aged seventy six, having been stabbed fifteen times and come back, can be cheerful, the rest of us can too. Great, it's note. a book of great optimism. Great thought to end. You know, this he he on. he calls it something like it's it's something like wounded happiness. It's a wonderful phrase. Yeah. yeah, it's good, isn't it? Well, as the late great Ernest Hemingway said, he said, "Life breaks everybody, but some grow stronger at the places where they break." And so it seems. Thank you for that, Matt. Brilliant. Be more, so, be more rushdy, is my be slogan. more rushdy. Be more Salmon. Great. Um, as ever, folks, get your questions in and any feedback to two mats at tnepublishing.com. That's the number two M A T T S at tnepublishing.com. We had a full post bag after uh, after our trans podcast we certainly last did. week. It was very good. Thank you for all those messages. If you listen on Spotify, you can message us there, and that's what John Lane did, who said a grateful thanks for the weekly culture email. I really missed Matt's recommendations every week when he left Tortoise. So it's great to have them back again. And Civil War is... I don't know. Asterixed out there. I don't know. Is... What? Oh! <laughs> this, just to explain, dear listeners, there's five asterixes 
on my thing. So I was. Like, it was an expletive. Civil War is shite. What is it? But yeah. no, Civil War is five stars. It is, it is very <laughs> okay. good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, John Lane. Um, you did enjoy Civil War, didn't you? I loved it. Yeah. No, yeah. I think I, I, think I, I might go and see it at the weekend. I, I, I really can't recommend it highly enough. It's terrific. Brilliant. Many more questions on our regular uh, Sunday Q&A coming up in a couple of days' time. Please remember our subscription offer. Head to the neweuropean.co.uk forward slash two mats. There is a link in the show notes and it's the best subscription offer available. So don't hesitate. Just jump on in. Thanks as ever to producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio with support from Ollie Peart. And until next week. It's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye. So, retrospectors, what historical events are we ticking off on this week's run of Today in History? Well, Monday is the anniversary of the day a much-loved entertainer died on live TV. Then on Tuesday, we remember the Roots sensation of 1977. On Wednesday, we unearth the bizarre story of the longest war you've never heard of. On Thursday, the day an Italian became Queen of Poland. And on Friday, we celebrate the women who infiltrated the men-only Boston Marathon. We discuss this and more on Today in History with the Retrospectors. Ten minutes each weekday, wherever you get your podcasts.